Good morning, Coastway Church. How are you this morning? Good, good. My name is Seth Brown, as Jeremy mentioned, and I'm so just uh, so thrilled to be here with you this morning. Uh, my wife and I are coming from the Winston-Salem area. We live in a little part of Winston called Clemens, and we've actually only lived there for about a year, so we're still figuring everything out. But yeah, three, a dad to three daughters, so uh, life is kind of crazy. And if you do, if we do talk later today, just to let you know, no, we're not going to keep trying for a boy, okay? Because it seems like all we can make is girls and three kids. Anybody, does anybody in here have more than three kids? Just raise, raise your hand, okay? Is there only one in here that has more than three kids? Oh my gosh, man, a lot of crazy jokes just went through my mind, but luckily my filter's on because it's, you know, because Jesus is with me. But God bless you guys. I feel like it takes a special, pe- special people to have more than three, so may the Lord bless you and keep you. So we, we are really glad to be here today. Um, one thing I'll, Jeremy mentioned, we've known each other for about 10 years, and um, what he wouldn't tell you because he's, you know, a, a humble and, and faithful guy is uh, 10 years ago when we met, I was a uh, confused, freshly, uh, freshly saved uh, college student. And Jeremy was a college pastor at a church that we both attended, and he saw this confused college student who had been through a lot of ups and downs, who was trying to figure out the faith. And for some reason, he decided he wanted to spend some time to actually invest in me. So Jeremy was the first person to actually pour into my life and show me how to walk with Jesus so that I could become like Jesus. And he has been, he has played such a vital role in my walk with the Lord that I I don't doubt that I would not be here in front of you today if it wasn't for him noticing me and seeing something and deciding that he wanted to actually invest in my life. And so I'm, you have a pastor who loves the gospel, who loves Jesus, and who loves people. And um, I know you are really grateful to have him, and I'm grateful that he's your pastor, and I'm grateful that he is my friend. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 3. That's where we're going to pick up. And you know, uh, just to brag on Jeremy just a little bit more, because he's not going to want me to go on and on about him, because he'll feel embarrassed. But um, you know, Jeremy does remind me a, 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 a lot like Paul. If, if you've been following along with Galat- in, in the Galatians series, the thing that will stick out to you, especially if you might be, you know, a, a little bit more of a sensitive millennial or Gen Z, like I can tend to be, you know, you see, you're like, Paul, he's pretty aggressive in Galatians. He's kind of coming in, he's coming in hot um, and he's urgent and he's intense. And we've seen for good reason, he is urgent and he is intense in the book of Galatians. And Jeremy's the same way. I think he's, he's urgent and intense for all the right reasons. And that's one of the most challenging things about being his friend in a, in a good way. It's challenged me to be, not challenging in a negative way. I know that probably sounded funny. Uh, challenging in a positive way. He, chal- he pushes me and challenges me to just be urgent with people and urgent with the gospel. And so for that, I'm really grateful. But let's jump into the book of Galatians. We're gonna pick up in chapter three. You've already seen that Paul is writing a letter um, in haste. And with some urgency for one primary reason. And that main reason is because the the church in Galatia, they were beginning to fall under the sway of a fake news gospel, of a false gospel. And in essence, this gospel was saying, you have to actually be Jewish in order to be a follower of Jesus. So they had some people come into the church who were saying, you you, you, you know, you're a part of God, you yeah, you're a part of God's family, but to stay in God's family, you've got to become Jewish. You've got to add adherence to the Jewish law in order to stay in the family. And they were coming under sway of that false gospel. So they were losing sight of the real gospel, which is just seeing and believing Jesus. So Paul sharply refutes this notion. And so we're going to read the whole passage. We're going to be in 14 verses a day. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to read you the whole thing, and then we'll go back through and work a little bit more slowly through it. So let's read God's word. If you're ready to read, say amen. amen. Let's read God's word. Paul writes, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or does he do this by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Would you take a moment and pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for the fact that you uh, speak to us exactly where we are. You know exactly where we've been. You know exactly what we need. And I pray that in the next couple of moments that your spirit would convict us and comfort us, that we would be able to see Jesus more clearly as we work through your word. We love you and we do this all in your name. Amen. So Katie and I, we've been married um, going on eight years. And when you get married, you know you come together and you come together with some baggage, right? Okay, raise your hand if you're married in here. Yep, awesome, a lot of you guys. So you come together and what you bring to the table when you come and get married is you bring habits and rituals from your families of origin, right? And then the thing that's kind of uh, fun but can be a challenge early in marriage is you're bringing these habits and rituals to a new family. And you've got to figure out what are the rhythms of this family that we're creating going to be now? What are they going to be? And so Katie and I, we just now, probably over the last couple of years, I feel like we have established our family rhythms a little bit, you know, like how many decorative pillows should we have around our house? We've, uh, we, we've had many conversations about that. And when I say conversations, I mean that pillows have just shown up and I've said nothing about it at all. So we've figured out what that looks like. You know, we've had conversations, how early is too early to decorate for fall? Fall is Katie's favorite season. So she thinks she can usher in the fall time in July. And we've had some great conversations about that. But we've basically over the last couple of years, we've realized, all right, we've created some new rhythms as a family. And we've come together. We have a new family culture. And we've put behind some things from our families of origin. Now, let me, let's do a thought experiment. What if when we go home later today or later this week, I decide, you know what? It's time to act like 16-year-old Seth again in my new family. Let me act how I did in my family of origin as a 16-year-old and bring that into my marriage. Question, would that go well for me? No, because I do that sometimes, honestly, and it doesn't ever really turn out that great, Okay when we try to bring in habits from our old family of origin into this new family. And this is kind of what what is happening in this church in Galatia. You see, God had created for himself this new family that was made up of both Jew and Gentile. It's a huge theme in the New Testament. The fact that God breaks down the barrier between these two ethnic groups and brings them together to form one family of faith focused on Jesus. And so this church was was focused on this new family that was made by faith. And then some teachers came in and said, actually, to stay in God's family, you've got to act like the Jewish family. You've got to act like a different family. And unfortunately, the people in this church started to believe it. They they were 16-year-old Seth bringing that into their marriage when they're 30 years old. And this is what was happening. So was The reason Paul is so urgent is because this text, it is a fight for God's family. Who is included in the family? What does it take to be included in the family? And how do I even live once I am in God's family? And so the Galatians were basically dismissing or answering these three questions wrongly. Who's in the family? How do I get in the family? And what do I do once I'm in the family? How do I live? They were answering these questions wrongly. And so Paul writes to them sharply to try to keep them in God's family, in the family of blessing. Because that's really what God's family is all about. God has created everything that you see because he's a God who loves and who blesses. 
And he desperately wants to bless his creation. And the way he blesses his creation is by making himself accessible through his son so that those who place their faith in his son can be in God's family of blessing and look forward to an inheritance with God in a new creation forever and ever, amen. But we humans, we know how to mess things up. And even though we have access to a blessing, a lot of times we try to put ourselves in what I would call the family of curse, where instead of receiving from God, what we do is we try to achieve for God. And this whole series is about being set free from one thing so that you can embrace another. And really the big idea of our sermon today is this, the culture of God's family is all about receiving rather than achieving. The culture of God's family is all about receiving rather than achieving. So you can be in the family of blessing as one who sees Jesus and receives from God Or unfortunately, if you try to live life achieving for God instead of receiving from God, then you'll find yourself feeling like you're living in a curse. And that's what Paul is going to get at in our text this morning. So thankfully, Paul is going to clarify some things for us. And he's so urgent because of how high the stakes really are. Because the church in Galatia, they were simply throwing away the gospel message and they were throwing away basically their own well-being. And so Paul naturally comes and is urgent. So what we're going to do is we're going to see three things Paul does with this church in Galatia to make sure that they are a part of the family blessing. So we're going to look at an intervention. We're going to look at an invitation and we're going to look at an inheritance. I'm going to give you the, the, whole, the whole outline there. We're going to look at an invitation. We're going to look at an intervention, an invitation and an inheritance. So let's go back and read verse one with me so that we can look at Paul's intervention with the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul's coming in hot, right? Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What does this mean? Well, we've already established why he's so urgent. And really what Paul is doing when he says the word bewitched, it's a really rare word in the New Testament. All it means is who's put you under a spell? Who has blinded you? Who has made you think that, Falsehood is truth, and truth is falsehood. Who has put you under a spell? They were throwing away their lives with a false belief, and Paul was addressing that. You know, it was uh, Dallas Willard who said, ideas have consequences. What you believe will dictate who you become and what you do. That's why belief is so important. Deeply held belief, because our ideas have consequences. And so Paul, he asks him, who has put you under a spell? And then he says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And just to clarify, this doesn't mean that they actually witnessed Jesus' crucifixion because they were far away and they were primarily Gentiles. So we know that they didn't see the the crucifixion, but we do know that Paul visited them and Paul did not withhold any part of the gospel message from them. He publicly portrayed Jesus to them as crucified. He preached the gospel to them in such a vivid way, it was as if they could see him. Plus, if you're a history nerd, you might know that in the first century, you didn't have to have a great imagination to picture what a crucifixion was like because you probably saw one. Walking into your city one day, you might see a number of people crucified outside the city gates. And so Paul tells them about the most significant crucifixion that had ever taken place, the crucifixion of the Lord of life. And he publicly portrayed Jesus before them as crucified. Jesus was right in front of them and they were under a spell and they could not see them. Just remember, they're in God's family, but they think that the criteria for staying in God's family had somehow changed. We go from receiving, seeing Jesus and receiving Jesus to adhering to ritual observance of the Jewish law. That's the false fake news gospel that they had started to, hold, that started to follow. So the Galatians, they went from seeing Jesus to being deceived. And I want to spend a few moments talking about sight and talking about our aim, because this is a really important part of our text this morning. This is a universal truth, and that is this. What we see and what we aim at is who we become. What you put in front of you, what you see and what you aim at is who you become. What we, you've heard it said before, what you behold is what you become. That's exactly what Paul is putting before them. You are either under a spell and you're bewitched and your vision is blurry or Jesus is put before you and you start becoming like him. 
And you might ask, why is this the case? Well, the reason this is so is because we are, we are created by God to be imitators of something. We are all imitators of something. And we fulfill our purpose as created beings when we imitate God. But so often, instead of imitating God, we imitate whatever else is right in front of us. So kids can't hide the fact that, they, that they're created to be imitators. And there's a million examples of my kids, uh, but one that actually I, I was thinking about talking to Katie this morning was uh, I am an old soul, and I've been in Dadville basically before I had kids. My friends in college used to call me dad because I just kind of have the dad vibes. You know, I'm kind of kind of boring. I go to bed early, and, you know, I like don't use an iPad. I use, like, paper notes for stuff. So uh, I kind of live in Dadville. And so one of the things that I, that I do that I don't even notice is I've got a dad posture that sometimes I fall into where hands go on the hips, <laughs> belly comes out. And I don't even feel it happening. It's like a gravitational pull, and it just kind of pulls at my waist, and belly goes out. And our oldest daughter, when she was about two, two years old, I didn't know this was happening, but she started standing like this <laughs> and just sticking her belly out. And toddlers already, they man, those Buddha bellies, I, that's my favorite thing about having toddlers is just sticking those little bellies out. But they're professional imitators. Uh, you know, another thing Emma did recently is... Uh, she said, Katie and I just, you know, recently decided we don't want to get heart disease, so we want to start exercising more. And so we've been talking about that around the house. And Emma, I was trying to, we were trying to get the kids to go outside because when they're a little older and you're, you know, tired and want alone time, you're like, just go outside and, you know, dig up, you know, fossils or something. Just, you know, <laughs> whatever. Just do something. And Emma said, ah, oh, God, I can't go up outside because I got to go upstairs and exercise and take care of my body. I'm like, you're not taking care of your body. You weigh 35 pounds and just your, your body's fine. So anyways, kids are professional imitators and what they see is who they become. That's why when you get older, you, you do things that your parents did growing up for better or for worse. Those progressive commercials, they're real. How to not become like your parents. And that's funny, but a lot of us probably have a lot of hurt from our families of origin. And when we see some of those patterns start to spill over into our adult lives, it kind of breaks us. Because sometimes we try to counter, this is, wasn't originally part of the sermon, but hopefully it helps you. Sometimes we try to be so unlike our families of origin that we overcorrect and get way too far on the other end and we do something else dysfunctional. When in reality, if we aim at Jesus, that is who we ought to become. So don't aim at the opposite of your parents, aim at Jesus. When you aim at Jesus, you become like Jesus. And the Galatians had stopped aiming at Jesus and they started aiming at following these rituals and this observance to the Jewish law. What you aim at is who you'll become. And really the application for us when you think about this text is you will never outgrow your need to have Jesus right in front of you. You do not graduate as a Christian past, I need to see Jesus today. You can be a Christian for 40 years and you you will still have a desperate need to wake up every day and see Jesus and walk with him. A way I like to put it is you're, you you got to learn to take Jesus to work with you. It took me way too long to figure out that uh, in America, we are professionals at compartmentalizing our lives. So even in church culture, we rightfully teach people to have what we call a quiet time where they meet with God in the morning. But what we don't often teach people to do is how do you take your quiet time to work with you? How do you actually take Jesus to work with you so that you see him throughout your day so that the moment you get in your car, you don't forget everything you just read? I remember having this experience in college. We would, we would hold each other accountable for reading the word and for praying. And then I remember we would pray and read in the morning and I'd go to class and I'd left Jesus back at my house. I wasn't keeping him in front of me. And so one thing that just, just to get hyper-practical here, I know you guys have gotten some resources from this Galatians series. I mean, why not just take this to work with you and at your lunch break, just read one chapter of Galatians. We need these breaks throughout the day to put Jesus back in front of us. If you're married, it's probably helpful to text your spouse throughout the day to check on them. Hey, I love you. I'm thinking about you. That means a lot to your spouse. And in the same way, we've got to, we've got to put Jesus back in front of us because he's always available. He's always willing. He's always ready to be a giver and a blesser, but we have to be receivers. 
That's why this idea that we achieve for God rather than receiving from God is so dangerous because when we achieve for God, we don't need Jesus because we're doing all the work. And that's what Paul is trying to refute. And this has taken me a lot of time to realize, and I still fail at this if I'm being honest. But when we don't see Jesus, we start acting dysfunctional. And this is what Paul's series of questions that we're about to read is all about. So let's read verses two through five. And really this is gonna, this is the part uh, that's, that's, that, uh, that's what I would call the intervention. All right, so Paul's about to have his intervention here when he says this. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul's awesome here. You know, he says, let me ask you uh, only one question. Uh, how dare you? What gives you the right? That's an office quote. Forgive me. He says, I have one question. And then in, the sec- in this section, he asks six questions. All right. Uh, that does not work in marriage. Paul is allowed to do it because he's an apostle. Okay. And there was a lot at stake here. But he's so urgent. This is because he's, he's trying to, I guess, de-spellbound these Galatians who were under this spell that they thought that they were supposed to achieve for God instead of receive from God. I would say that Paul's intervening questions can be summed up like this. Did you get the gift of God's spirit from believing a message or from living under Jewish law? That's what he's saying. Did you get the gift of God's spirit from believing a message or from living under Jewish law? Another way to put it that might make more sense to us in the 21st century is what actually has given you that life-giving experience? Is the life-giving experience from becoming Jewish or is it from hearing about God's love and his mercy and his grace and his crucifixion on your behalf? Is it by hearing and believing a message? Or is it adhering to ritual observance to the law? What has really led to you getting life? They were forgetting where true life was to be found. They thought it was to be found by achieving instead of receiving from God. But the culture of God's family, as as we've already mentioned, is all about receiving rather than achieving. And here's another silly example. So in, uh, in high school, I played baseball, and baseball is a pretty superstitious sport. Is there any baseball players in here? You know, even T-ball, I count that, you know, that works. So baseball is pretty superstitious. Uh, You know, I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitious. I knew you guys would like that. Okay. Sermon's over. Pack up your Bibles. Just kidding. Um, That's another office quote. Forgive me. But um, in baseball, it's kind of a superstitious sport. And what I would do is embarrassing to say now, but you're a captive audience, so you have to listen. Um, I would put a quarter in my cleat before the games. And somehow that was supposed to help me. And uh, probably why I have back problems now, you know, so they probably did the opposite. But did putting a quarter in my cleat actually help me? Or did practicing hitting a baseball, would that have helped me in the games, right? So seeing and hitting a baseball would have been more helpful than putting a quarter in my cleat. And this is kind of what the Galatians were doing. So instead of actually seeing the object of their faith and putting him before them each and every day, they decided, let's do some other things instead. That's what God wants. God doesn't want us to put his son before him. He wants us to become a part of the Jewish family. And that's just not at all what what was meant to be the case. The question that Paul is asking them is, do you think that God gives out the gifts of the spirit based on how ethnically Jewish somebody could become? No, not at all. This is what the Galatians were struggling to believe. But we know, and I'll explain this in a moment if you're confused about what it means to actually receive the Spirit, but we know that we experience true life, that deep feeling of life-giving experience. We experience that from receiving the message and the ministry of Jesus. Think about the, if you are a Christ follower in this room, think about when you started following Jesus, you had an aha moment. It clicked you had this feeling of conviction. You had this feeling of being known and even being forgiven and loved. And something clicked inside of you that you might not be able to articulate, but it's something that felt like it was life-giving. 
That's receiving the Spirit. And Paul is saying, you guys had this experience in Galatia. Why do you think that you continue in the Spirit in a different way? You start with Jesus. He gives you the Spirit. You end with Jesus, who keeps giving you the Spirit. And you walk in Him. And that is what the Christian life is really all about in a nutshell. You have tasted to see and seen what it's like to be a part of God's family. And now are you trying to become a part of a different family? That's the question at hand. So what, is, what else does it mean to receive the Spirit? Because I've just mentioned receiving the Spirit is, you know, God's Spirit is God's life-giving presence, right? And there are so many things you could say about this. I mean, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we're going to have to move on. But it is the, in, in the present, receiving God's Spirit is that moment of conviction or compassion that is hard to articulate. And it is a subjective experience. I'll, I'll grant you that. But you've experienced that if you're a Christ follower, most likely, that moment. And granted, that moment doesn't always last forever. That's why you got to keep Jesus in front of you. Because many of us in kind of Christian culture, we hit like this high mountaintop and then nobody told us what to do from there. So we just kind of come down off the mountain until we hit another mountain. And our goal is, of course, to hit the mountaintop and then learn to not necessarily stay on the mountain because life is up and down. I mean, Psalm 23, but to actually learn to walk with Jesus throughout your days so that you don't go down to the bottom of the valley and then have to get picked back up. So what is receiving the spirit? Well, I would say that Paul has here in mind both present and future implications. The present implications of receiving the spirit is I'm convicted, but I know I'm loved by God and accepted by God and adopted by God. But then the Bible, when it talks about receiving God's spirit, there's always a future element to it that a lot of us don't always talk about. The future element of receiving the spirit is the notion that we are God's children who will one day receive an inheritance in the new creation. That's a profound reality that we don't often take time to think about. But that's what Paul is speaking about, especially at the end when he says that we're supposed to receive this promised spirit. It is God's deposit in your heart telling you that when I make all things new, I've got a piece of land with your name on it. So whenever you get that experience of conviction or the experience of being reawakened by God's love, you should take that as a sign of God saying, I've got some real estate for you in the new creation. I've got, some, I've got an inheritance for you. And we're going to speak to that a little bit more towards the end, but there's present and future implications to the Spirit. And it really will help our walk with Jesus. It will really help us keep Him in front of us if we realize that in the present, God wants to do something in us, and in the future, God wants to do something in us and also for us. And the way that we know we experience that for sure is simply by keeping Jesus in front of us and putting the rituals behind us. We receive from God. We don't achieve for God. And the last thing I'll say about receiving God's spirit, the primary ministry of the spirit is to help you see Jesus. The primary ministry is to put a spotlight on Jesus. It's not just when I say what gives you life, sometimes you might wonder, well, what does that mean? Like I play golf and that gives me life, you know? And golfing, you can play golf for the glory of God. I don't because I lose too many balls and it costs too much money. And so that's not one of the things that gives me life. But you can... Play golf while seeing Jesus to the glory of God. And the Spirit helps you take the normal things in life and see Jesus in them and delight in them. And Paul's telling the Galatians, they've got to see Jesus and receive from Jesus. So we'll talk about the inheritance a little bit later, but Paul, what he wants to do now that he's had his intervention, he wants to give the Galatians an invitation. He wants to remind them of an invitation and he wants to give them an invitation. So let's go back to verse 7. Read verses seven through nine with me when Paul writes, know then that is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So you can see some of these themes coming up in verses seven through nine. Paul says that those of the faith are the sons of Abraham, i.e. those who trust Jesus, who trust God's promises. They are a part of God's family. That's where we're getting this notion of family. But then you also see some other elements that we're going to talk about today. But this is what we would call the invitation. Paul is reminding the Galatians of the invitation that they received into God's family by faith. 
So here's what's genius about Paul, because the Bible is awesome. And the whole Bible is a story that points to Jesus. So the more you know it, the more you'll see how it points to Jesus. But these false teachers were essentially, they were, what, they were coming into the church and they were saying, you got to be circumcised. That's a part of Jewish ritual adherence to the law. So you got to be circumcised. Later, Paul says something pretty snarky to these people talking about circumcision. But thankfully, Jeremy didn't ask me to preach that one because that one's going to be a good one. God bless you. I'll stream it because I want to see how it goes. So they were all about Abraham's story. So they were coming into this church and they were saying, you have got, you've got to be circumcised to be part of God's family. And then Paul, because he knows his Bible, he says, actually, when God first approached Abraham, he counted it as righteousness because Abraham simply believed that God was telling the truth. Before Abraham was circumcised, he trusted God's promise. And Paul tells us this is what it was supposed to be from the beginning. The invitation into God's family was supposed to always be about faith. What is faith? Well, I think Jeremy has been saying faith is eyesight of the soul. Love that picture. I think that's awesome. Faith is, um, there's a bunch of ways you could define it. Uh, In general, faith is just trusting God's promises. You don't want to have faith in your, in your own faith. That's sometimes what we do is we have faith in faith. We have to have an object of our faith. So God is the promise giver and the promise keeper. And we just believe that he actually is the promise keeper. That's what faith is. Another definition that I really like for faith is faith is knowing enough to act. Faith is knowing enough to act. What that means is God tells you a promise. You don't know all the answers. Anybody in here have all the answers? I definitely don't. Uh, When you're a parent, one of the things that we say all the time is we'll talk about a situation one of our kids are dealing with or doing. And uh, honestly, most of the time we say, I have no idea what we're doing. I don't know. Let's Let's just pray that God helps us because we're helpless here. But faith is knowing enough to act. It's just knowing a little bit and responding to it. And the reason that this is so important to understand is because it covers the entire walk of your Christian life. Remember, when you came to Jesus and you responded to the message, you heard a simple message. God died for you. God loves you. He resurrected. He's coming back. He wants you as his own. That's what you heard. And you heard that message. And what was your action? Often for many of us, it's like, let's just, let me just pray. Jesus, I believe that you're, that you're real, that you're, what you mean is true. But then if you've been a Christian for 10, 20 years, that definition of faith still helps you because you learn things along the way and you hear things and then you can respond to them. It covers a whole, a whole range of human and Christian experience. That definition of faith is simply knowing enough to act. And so Paul, what he does is he, take, he takes Abraham's story that was being misconstrued and he shows the Galatians, actually Abraham's story is all about faith. Because God is a giver and a blesser, and he wants to bless the whole world and all the families in the world through Abraham's family. That's why one theme throughout the entire scriptures is the theme of family, which I love that Jeremy uses that as he's explaining what it means to be a part of Coastway, because we all are meant to belong to a family. The Big C Church belongs to God's family, and the Big C Church is a product of Abraham's family thousands of years ago, This one guy in the Middle East who believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And now you're sitting in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, listening to a sermon about Jesus. You see how one family can bless many different families? And here's the amazing thing. God's family, the invitation into God's family is by faith alone. By hearing that God makes a promise and simply responding to it, taking one step. You know, any, is there any um, like type A kind of black and white people in the room? You can raise your hand. I'm with you. Okay, we got one. Wow, a lot of creatives, I guess. Man, Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy's black and white. I love it. Um, sometimes with uh, black and white people, you get like frustrated that when you start following Jesus, you're not like automatically fully sanctified immediately and that God's got to work on you. And he's got to do some stuff. But there's a lot you could say about this, but God God is so faithful that you don't have to be perfect as soon as you come to Jesus. Faith is knowing enough to act. It's taking one step at a time. That is all it is. So you're invited into the family and then God walks with you as you stay in the family. 
So here's a weird example. I've told you that we are, uh, we started like exercising recently also to get really nerdy. Uh, when you have kids, your health insurance, like you pretty much always like hit your deductible. So we've basically, we've basically done that and we've started, um, you know, if I think I might get a cold, I'll just go to the doctor and my own, whatever. Insurance is going to pay for it now. And so Katie and I have been seeing a, uh, uh, we, we go into a chiropractor, which, you know, there's a lot you could say about that, but we love it. It's really helpful. Basically what a chiropractor does is they align your spine because when your spine is in line, your body works better. I mean, that's what they tell me. And so I believe it because my back feels better. So I'm not a doctor, could be wrong, but it's been going well for us. But here's what, here's what they do is just the normal ups and downs of life will get your spine out of whack. And then you go to this chiropractor and they line you back up, right? And this is a lot how our faith journey is. You guys know that when you place your faith in Jesus, there are ups and downs. There are some days that knock you on your back more than other days. Am I right? There are some days where you're like, God, why is this happening? Why isn't this easier? Why is this happening to me? And things knock you back. And where you might make a mistake is if you get knocked on your back and then you start trying to achieve for God because you think you're supposed to earn your way out of this mess. You're supposed to just pick yourself up by your bootstraps and make everything happen and you just move forward and you'll fix your situation on your own. But the best thing you can do when you get knocked on your back is to go back to God, put Jesus in front of you and say, Jesus, what are you trying to do for me and through me and in me through this crazy circumstance? I wanna be a receiver. I don't wanna be an achiever. I wanna receive and respond, not be deceived and try to achieve. So we got to be a receiver of Jesus and all that he gives, not just an achiever. And what was happening in Galatia was they went from children with their hands open, ready to receive from Jesus, to astronauts trying to climb to the moon with a rope made of sand. Because that's what happens when we try to achieve for God, is we're like astronauts trying to climb to the moon with a rope made of sand. When he wants us to be like little helpless children, frankly, ready to receive God's life-giving presence and to respond to him one day at a time, no matter what situation you're in. So we don't know everything about the situation that was happening to the Galatians, but we do know that Paul is desperately pleading with them, saying real life is found by being invited into God's family by faith and then seeing Jesus right in front of you each and every moment of every day. That is what Paul is really trying to tell us. So, Let me recap before we go into this last section here. The Galatians thought that they had to be Jewish in order to be included into God's family. Paul tells them, poppycock, whatever that means. No, that's not true. Those in God's family enter into the family by faith. And then he has this intervention and he reminds them of their invitation. And so now what Paul does is he's firmly loaded this text with the idea of being in God's family, talking about Abraham and Abraham's family, blessing all the families of the world. And then because Paul knows his Old Testament and knows how it points to Jesus, in this last section, verses 10 through 14, he basically gives us two choices, the family of blessing or the family of curse. Those are, the, those are our options that we alluded to at the beginning. And this is what he says in this last section here, verses 10 through 14. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. We see the spirit coming back in here. But here's Paul's basic argument because I'm running out of time. Paul is saying that if you put yourself under law, nobody can keep that law. So you're putting yourself under a curse that the law prescribes. So when you act like that being a part of God's family is about following the Jewish law, then what you're doing is you're saying, I want to inherit the curse that the Jewish people had to endure for their failure to keep the law. But praise be to God, who in spite of the curse that the Jewish people group brought upon themselves for their failure to keep the law, praise be to God that he decided to wrap himself in flesh and take on a curse that wasn't his fault, that wasn't his problem, except he made it his problem. 
because he loves his people. And Paul is saying, either you can bear the curse or you can let Jesus bear the curse. And Jesus wants to bear the curse for you because he loves you. He wants you to see him. He wants you to receive from him. And one of the things he wants you to receive from him is the promised spirit. And this promised spirit reminds us of our last point here. It reminds us of the inheritance we have as a part of God's family. The promised spirit is a piece of land in the new creation with your name on it. Some of us, when we think about heaven, we just think about this boring place in the clouds where you just sing all day. We don't have a real vision of what heaven is like. But what the New Testament and the Old Testament tells us is that eternity is this world only made new. And in eternity, there's actually going to be work to do somehow, if you can imagine it. Everything that is good now is going to be greater in the new creation. And we actually are going to have a role to play in cultivating God's good and glorious and redeemed creation. You get a real role to play. And the spirit is the guarantee of your inheritance in the new creation. A day where every tear is wiped away from your faces. Where everything that is painful is cast away. Where death has lost its sting. And the reason this reality is certain is because Jesus became a curse for us. He became a curse so that we could be inheritors of the new creation where he is Lord, we know our rightful place, we know his rightful place, and we get to find life as it always was meant to be in this new inheritance. This is why we cannot forfeit being a part of God's family by trying to achieve because we are supposed to simply receive. We receive and we respond. And that's where true life is found. Paul ties in beautifully the whole story of the Old Testament and proves that what these guys are coming and saying is simply false. And if you want to have life, you let Jesus be the curse bearer and how about you be the inheritor? And then one day, all things will be set right as they were meant to be in the beginning. You can probably see now why so much was at stake for what Paul was saying. You can see now why Paul tries to convince them that the culture of God's family is all about receiving rather than achieving. And the way that we, be rem- that we are reminded of the culture of God's family, the way that you keep this in front of you, so to speak, is you put Jesus in front of you. Jesus tells us, or Paul tells us that Jesus was publicly portrayed before us as crucified. And so we can take him with us to work, to school, to dinner. And so today we're going to get the chance in a few minutes to actually practice putting Jesus before us with the Lord's Supper. There's really not a better way to do what we're about to do than to take the supper and be reminded of Jesus's curse bearing ministry on our behalf. So what I would love to do for you is... I'm honored to be here. I'm really grateful to see God moving here at Coastway. I just want to pray for God's hand over this church. I want to pray for God's blessing. I want to pray for God's love and his goodness to just be evident in the lives of everyone in this room and everyone who will one day be in this room. And I would just like to take a moment and lift this church up, praying that you are able to keep Jesus in front of you. Father, You sent your son to bear a curse for us. And it is something that I forget every day. We are professional forgetters. But I pray, Father, that even in our forgetfulness and our faithlessness, that we're reminded of your goodness and your faithfulness. That we're reminded that you took upon yourself a curse so that we could be invited into your family and inheritors of your promise of a new world, a new land, a new place. And I pray, Father, that when we get weary, when we get tired, when we even, when our vision, when it grows dim, 
that we would see your goodness, see Jesus as the ultimate gift, and then also just relish in the fact that you are going to make all things new and you're going to allow us to be a part of it by faith alone, by believing that when you say you're gonna do something, you're gonna do it. That's what faith is. And I pray that our faith would transcend into the deepest parts of our hearts and it would cause a response that would lead to you being glorified all over the world. And I pray that we'd see a glimpse of that through your family here at Coastway. God, we desperately need you. We pray these things all in the name of Jesus. Amen.